Angelo is out here showing you how to get rich, gym owners. This is yeah. a secret. Take, take it, take it, and that's it. You need a hundred grand, a six hundred and fifty credit score, and no bankruptcy. And you call Angelo; he's going to give you nine hundred grand. There's also, you know, conversely, no prepayment penalties in those situations. So you hit the lottery or something, and you want to get rid of all your debt. There's not, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, five percent kind of early, you know, payoff fee, effectively. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Gym World Worldwide. I am John Franklin here today with Mateo Lopez and special guest Angelo Medici, not Medici. He <laughs> is the senior vice president at Live Oak Bank, which is the largest SBA lender in the United States by dollar volume. And he is in charge of all their gym stuff. So today, yes. <laughs> yes. That is the all title. The, all all head, the of, head of head of the gym world for Live yes. Oak Bank. Uh, like gym world, yeah, yes. Yeah. So today, dear gym owners, uh, Angelo is going to show you how you can buy your building. He's going to show you how you can get a little bit of other people's money to grow your business, and he's going to show you um, how you can work with him to buy out all your competitors and start a gym empire. I mean, it is uh, pretty sweet because most gym owners we talk to are like, I need more members. I need more money. It's like, we, this is a guy who can get you some money. It sounds like. So yeah, we got uh, a little bit of it stored around here. So yeah. I'd like to okay. like to give it out when we can. <laughs> so explain, explain what Live Oak Bank is. I tried my hardest, but I probably butchered it um, to, to someone who's unfamiliar with the world of uh, SBA lending. Sure. Yeah. And first of all, thanks for having me on. Excited to uh, chat with you guys and all of your all of your listeners. So hopefully can provide some good information uh, for everybody. You know, high level. We are the nation's largest SBA lender, as you mentioned, uh, by dollar amount. Um, we're also a specialty lender in the sense that uh, we don't lend to every, you know, SBA approved industry. There's thousands of them out there. We are very particular. Um, we take our time doing some due diligence for you know, eighteen months, twenty four months before we kind of form a team internally to really focus in that space. And so, um, about five years ago, you know, fitness as an industry was uh, kind of up next, and um, it was of interest to me personally to um, you know take the opportunity to to build out kind of that team and, and uh, you know, business unit uh, for the bank. So um, every industry we lend in uh, here at Live Oak is kind of structured similarly. And, you know, the idea there is, uh, you know, conversations with customers should be easier. We, we should have more knowledge than, you know, just kind of your, your average lender that maybe looks at a whole bunch of different deals across different industries, you know, every day or, uh, you know, every week. Um, you know, I like to say, you know, here we know a lot about a little, meaning uh, a lot about the spaces that, you know, we individually work in where kind of the traditional banking structure is more regionalized based on geography. And they probably know a little about a lot. Um, so just a kind of flip of, of the traditional banking model, if you will. And, um, you know, it, again, hopefully is, is all in an effort to be able to serve our customers within those industries at a little better rate and, you know, faster pace, just because we kind of understand the in, ins and outs of, uh, you know, each of those, those businesses. And you said your bread and butter is helping with acquisitions, right? So acquisition capital, buying, buying existing businesses, or, um, I would imagine you guys do, a. Uh, last time we spoke, I, you guys do a decent amount of like franchise financing, right? That's right. I mean, you know, there, there's obviously, you know, hundreds of, you know, local or regional type concepts out there, but thousands of, of franchise concepts. And, you know, with a franchise, you kind of are able to learn that model and it's, you know, applicable across any type of deal uh, that you, you'd come across. But um, at the same time, we found a lot of success with, um, you know, localized businesses that have a stronger grip maybe in the community. Um, typically, that's needed if you're not going to be behind the flag of a franchise. Um, you got to be a little bit more ingrained in your community, and that can be a really positive and, and strong, um, you know, benefit and seen a lot of strong businesses because of that. Um, but, you, you know, you, you nailed it. Uh, acquisition financing is, is uh, the majority of what we do, um, you know, that 
isn't the only thing. Of course, we look to do expansions. So existing owners that, you know, maybe don't have an opportunity to purchase another location in their area, but, you know, found a space and want to build that out and, you know, basically build out another uh, unit for themselves and um, leveraging the, you know, existing business operations to kind of make that decision as well as, you know, real estate financing, um, which could be bucketed into the acquisition, but, um, you know, also able to, to look at commercial real estate opportunities. So um, nothing we don't do really, but those are kind of the three, you know, main kind of, uh, types of, you know, deals that, that we look at. So when you say acquisitions, is this like a, an F45 buying another F45 or like an F45 buying another franchise? Like what are the acquisitions that are happening? Yeah, it'd be the former. Um, so, you know, you own a uh, F45 across town. You're interested in, you know, taking your career or, or your life elsewhere, uh, whatever the reason may be. And, and you know, I'm you know, hungry for for more. I may reach out and, you know, try and obtain some financing to purchase your you know, business and, and those assets is effectively, um, you know, from you and, and leverage bank financing to, to, you know, support that transaction. And so what makes a gym bankable? So if you're a gym owner, you have dreams of selling one day. Um, I'm assuming being qualified by the SBA is going to allow you to sell for more. So, so if you're building towards that, like, what are you guys looking for when you're, when you're underwriting a deal? If you look at like trends, the fitness industry, like uh, there's been a lot more investment in spending. Like this is a growing industry, especially the last like five, six, seven years. But the the kind of corner of the fitness world we operate in, I feel like are not, it's kind of more of the wild west and not as uh, bankable as maybe some of the larger kind of franchises. So yeah, I, I am curious what, you know, what makes someone a, a, a good kind of target for you guys? Yeah, you know, there's, I'll, I'll kind of give a two pointed answer there. I mean, speaking on the SBA in general, um, and also, you know, with us in particular, cash flows king, right? So the ability to demonstrate that your business, um, you know, makes enough money effectively to support its debt obligations um, is the primary, you know, driving factor. And, you know, when I say makes enough money, um, the, the key metric there is, is EBITDA, right, which is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and, and amortization. So, um, you know, you kind of take your net income and you add back those uh, other expenses as, as non-recurring cash expenses, um, get that total EBITDA figure, and you look at that divided by what your annual debt payments are, you know, proposed to be, um, you know, for, for your financing, uh, also taking into consideration maybe any existing debts that you have on the b business leases or things like that. But, um, you know, at a very high level, that kind of equation is uh, what's called a debt service coverage ratio, that EBITDA divided by your, your debt payments. And, and that ratio is, is again, the, the key factor for SBA loans and, you know, with us as well, uh, as far as determining, you know, eligibility or, you know, being bankable, as you put it, um, you know, there's nuances that um, may come with, you know, you just opened another location or uh, still ramping up and the trends are looking, you know, very positive, but they may not quite be there yet. Um, you know, there's some exceptions that because we know the space so well and understand uh, the ins and outs of, you know, the fitness world uh, and, and those businesses that, um, you know, can kind of look at some other metrics to maybe get there. But, um, you know, for the most part, you, you want to make sure that that, you know, EBITDA figure is, is you know, exceeding what that uh, proposed debt payment is going to be on your business as a primary driving factor for, you know, again, being bankable. So the business needs to pay for itself, basically. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you know, depending on the, the type of debt, you know, um, what that ratio needs to be can... Uh, can differ um, when you're talking, you know, real estate, uh, a purchase, you know, that kind of ratio needs to come out to a, a one to one, meaning hopefully the business makes it, at least exactly enough to kind of support the debt needed for acquiring, um, you know, that business on an or that real estate rather on an annual basis. Um, when you're looking at acquisition of another business financing, that ratio needs to be um, for the SBA, a 1.15 debt service coverage ratio. 
Um, so there are some you know intricacies depending on the type of financing you're looking for and what the opportunity is that can change you know where that needs to land. But you nailed it. Uh, bare minimum business needs to you know effectively pay for it itself. Um, you know when you're looking at an annual uh, kind of run rate. So let's say a business is generating, we'll, we'll talk net income since uh, I would guess most of our owners don't have a ton of like debt service that they're, that they're dealing with right now. So let's say a business is spinning off around like a hundred thousand a year, right? Okay. When you, when you give off the coverage, you know, the, that 1.15. So what does that, what does that mean to a gym owner who's making, you know, a hundred thousand a year? Yeah, you know, I, I guess I would not to cheat a little bit, but if we could, you know, up that to one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars a year, <laughs> yeah. just, just to make it even simpler, <laughs> um, you know, you'd basically be looking for um, a max, you know, kind of annual debt payment based on the proposed, you know, loan terms and structure of of one hundred thousand dollars, right? So essentially, every dollar of debt you have, you know, your business needs to be throwing off a, you know. Dollar fifteen cents effectively to to support that ratio, and I find that to be a pretty simplistic and easy way to kind of think about it. Is um, you know breaking it down to a dollar of debt is you know need a dollar fifteen kind of, of of that net income or EBITDA. Okay, perfect explanation. So for every dollar fifteen of your bottom line, you can service a dollar of debt, um, and that and that's what you're going to be looking at. That that's what makes it uh, lendable. So. I would guess that would lead to pretty structured ranges for like the value of a business, right? Because sure. everything kind of needs to fall in that window because most of these deals get done through the through the SBA. So if you're a gym owner trying to figure out, hey, like what is my business worth? Like what would be your back of the envelope uh, method for telling them on like how to value their own business? Yeah, um, you know, transparently, I, you know, we don't do so much, you know, valuations of the business. Um, we leave that up to, you know, professional third parties to, um, you know, dive in and, and any SBA loan in an acquisition standpoint, you're going to have a, a third party business valuation company come in and, and really give a in-depth, you know, dive into what the value is, you know, in their opinion. Um, what, what we, kind of end up coming to is backdooring, if you will, that valuation by if your business can support, you know, the debt needed in an, in an acquisition, you know, situation, that business is probably valued fairly well, right? Um, you know, there's some ranges that, um, you know, happy to share, which are kind of industry norms. Um, and that's, that's what I'm be, looking for. Yeah. And that's going to be, you know, roughly three to four and a half times that EBITDA figure. Um, you know, the more units you own and you're packaging up in a, you know, sale scenario, maybe that, you know, multiple, as we call it, will uh, get a little higher. But, you know, a good kind of range to live by is, is again, that three to four and a half times, um, you know, EBITDA. Uh, figure is is where we see most of our deals that you know we're able to proceed with um, you know fall into. All right, so l let's say we have a, a gym that has a quarter million of EBITDA. Let's say the sale price is somewhere around like, a million bucks, right? Like, how would a typical deal structure look like um, that that you're working with if you wanted to go the the SBA route? Yeah. So, if you've been, uh, just to be clear, we're talking, you know, um, someone looking to sell with that type of uh, kind of. I'm EBITDA assuming figure. most of our. Yeah, yeah, or or yeah. buy either way, sure. but like uh, I'm sure probably most people listening to this would be interested in buying because yeah. on the selling side, they they, they want the money, <laughs> so they'll figure sure, out how to sure. do that. So so let's let's approach it from the angle of a buyer. Yeah, from the angle, you know. The reason I ask is only because, you know, when you're a buyer, it's, um, you know, sometimes difficult to push a seller into that kind of valuation range, if you will. Um, you know, what your business may be worth as an existing operator is a little bit separate, uh, if you will, from, you know, what a selling business that you may be interested in purchasing is priced at. But um, generally speaking, you know, if that was kind of the target business you were after, 
um, you know, SBA requirements, you know, look for 10% equity injection into a deal. So, you know, if you're talking a million dollar sales price, um, you know, $100,000, uh, you know, again, per SBA regulations would need to kind of come in from the buyer. Um, if you have an existing business already and you're looking to purchase, you can leverage that equity, if you will, and there's the ability to do upwards of 100% financing as an SBA lender, which would mean no money in from, you know, the buyer in that situation. Um, that's going to come down to, you know, the operations of your existing business and, you know, what that cash flow does look like. Um, but let's assume, you know, just that 10% for, for the purposes of this conversation, you know, Live Oak or any SBA lender would then look to, to fund that remaining $900,000. So that plus your $100,000 equity gets, you know, the seller that million dollars. Um, the really cool thing and the biggest benefit, you know, about SBA lending is the ability for the term of that loan to go upwards of 10 years um, with no balloon payments, which balloon payments are um, effectively a shorter time period than the term of your loan and then a balance of that loan being due all at once. So a large chunk that doesn't exist in the SBA world, which is, you know, really helpful. Um, and, <laughs> and relevant right around now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and there's also, you know, conversely, no prepayment penalties in those situations. So, um, you know, you hit the lottery or something and you want to get rid of all your debt. There's not uh, you know, one, two, three, four, five percent kind of early, you know, payoff, fee effectively. Um, so you're getting the most generous terms um, that really exist in any type of lending. Um, and when you talk about spreading those debt payments out over 10 years versus, you know, conventional loans are usually structured as, as five or seven year amortization periods. You know, when you go back to that debt service coverage uh, ratio um, and looking at your annual debt payments in comparison to your EBITDA, um, when those are stretched over 10 years versus five, uh, obviously easy math tells you you could effectively afford, you know, twice as much debt. So you're really lowering your monthly payments, you know, to the, to the most, uh, you know, flexible kind of, again, term that exists and you have the remaining flexibility of, you know, getting rid of that debt sooner if you're able to, or, you know, also not staring down the barrel of a large kind of, balloon uh, at some point throughout that, you know, life of, of the loan. So, you know, it's designed to be, you know, the most flexible and obtainable for small businesses. And I think, you know, with the way those terms are structured, it, it, it achieves that. Right. Because you can qualify. It's easier to qualify than a traditional like bank loan. Right. As well. Like you can what, what kind of credit you, you need, like a there's a minimum credit score, right? Yeah, there is. And that, that will differ, you know, transparently per lender more so than, you know, per SBA. We kind of live uh, at the 650 minimum, um, you know, and, and hopefully over 700, you know, that that's just a enhancement if, if, you know, the scores are that high. But yeah, personally, um, you know, no bankruptcies from the past. That's, you know, big Obviously, when you're dealing with uh, a government guaranteed kind of loan prog program, uh, bankruptcies are are uh, a no no, and then uh, you know credit score being above that 650 is uh, kind of the the minimum range from a personal standpoint there. And that's it. You need a hundred grand, a 650 credit score, and no bankruptcy. And you call Angelo; he's going to give you 900 grand. You there hear me right here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. And so, in terms, so they're paying interest on this this 900 grand, right? Like, what what type of terms are you seeing now? Because it, it's obviously changed a lot in the last few years. Like, what kind of an interest rate can they expect? What is, what does a payment look like on the you know a 900 a million? Let's call it a million dollar loan because the number is easier. Uh, you know, what can they expect there? From an SBA standpoint, the only restrictions that that exist from the you know base level of the program are, are kind of a maximum rate that they um, you know basically enforce that banks can't go above that, and that's to you know limit and, and or I guess not limit, but rather keep it more open for more applicants. Um, you know, our kind of interest rate is more of a risk based kind of pricing model, so the stronger you know, the cash flow and overall application, you know, you can expect the rate to be 
a little bit lower. Um, you know, right now in in the high interest rate environment that we're we're living in, um, we're mostly seeing and offering you know variable interest rates, and the thought behind that is um, you know let's not lock people into a fixed rate uh, at you know the the peak of kind of the interest rate uh, environment, at least as it relates to the, you know, certainly the past five years. Um, the way that we kind of calculate that or look at that is is the Wall Street Journal prime rate being the, the base rate, as we call it. So that's, you know, doesn't, as that goes up or down, it does not affect kind of the bank's um, profitability, et cetera. Um, so the spread above that Wall Street Journal prime rate is really where interest rates will differ from one customer to another, uh, potentially. And again, that's more risk-based pricing. Um, overall, it's not going to, you know, be a discrepancy of a full percentage point most of the time from from one individual or business to another. You're talking a quarter of a point, maybe just, you know, again, d- based on the risk profile of the entire kind of application, business and personal. Um, you know, what all that means as we sit here today, um, you know, before the next Fed meeting that could change everything uh, that I'm about to say, those rates are, you know, somewhere in the 10 to 10 and a half percent range. Um, you know, that could, again, quickly change one way or another, depending on what, you know, the government does with uh, that Wall Street Journal prime rate as the base rate. So our spread doesn't change in the environment as much as it's just that base rate that, you know, fluctuates a little bit. So am I seeing this right? The prime rate right now is 8.25%. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, it is up there. Yep, they've raised it pretty consistently, you know, every month this year, give or take. And the months they haven't, they've uh, kind of you know, done a double increase. So yeah, there's your chart right there. Um, so you're like, you're, you're, you're about, um, 2% on top of this kind of like a two to two and a half is what you're saying. Yeah. Give or take that's kind of, you know, the, the safe range, if you will, that, um, find ourselves falling into for the most part. Uh, and again, you know, when rates were, you know, when the base rate was five, that, that spread was still going to be the same. It's, it's uh, unfortunately, obviously, costs more to get debt, but it's not, you know, banks necessarily being greedy with the increase in rates there. It's just what the what the Fed has done, you know, in, in you know, an effort to fight inflation, quite frankly, by raising that base rate. But we're hopeful that that'll, you know, that pace at least will slow down. Um, and, you know, it, it hits a little harder because we're coming out of you know the pandemic when rates were rapidly lowered you know down to 3.25 i believe the the wall Rock street bottom rate right was. there right and so you know it, it's it's really not that outrageous that it's at eight and a quarter now it is in relation to how quickly it's happened but if you look over you know a yeah, historically period it, yeah. it's it's higher but it's not you know out of the realm of reasonability, I guess. Uh, it just seems a lot sharper because of the you know, rapid nature in which it's increased over a short period of time. As interest rates rise, I'm assuming business valuations go lower because the business can service less debt, right? So the valuation of a business won't necessarily change what a buyer may be able to obtain and afford to purchase a business could change. And that goes back to a little bit earlier, the, the debt service coverage and how we look at things isn't necessarily a valuation. Um, it's more a function of, you know, math, quite frankly, and can a business support the debt ba- and, and of course rate and all that goes into it. So what I guess another way of maybe breaking that down is, you know, a business that was worth a million could still be worth a million, but a buyer may have been able to afford you know, that $900,000 loan at a lower rate that now they can't. It doesn't necessarily mean the business they're looking to purchase or their existing business is worth less. They just may need to find a buyer or a buyer may need to be prepared to bring in more equity than they would have maybe been able to, you know, bring in before because the cost to borrow money is higher, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, you're, what you're saying is you haven't really seen too much of a change on the valuation side. It's just harder to get these deals done. 
Yeah, effectively. And, um, you know, I, I would say probably, you know, mid last year, we did finally see some sellers, I, I guess, maybe call it come back down to earth a little bit uh, on what they were asking and valuations maybe came down a little bit. But that was simply a function of, I think, finally realizing that your business likely changed uh, coming out of the pandemic. And, you know, it, it may not get back to that pre pandemic level of operation where, you know, if you were looking to sell coming out of the pandemic, you probably were going off of a, a pre pandemic kind of run rate, if you will. So, um, you know, some businesses are doing better, a lot, you know, didn't make it and a lot are still fantastic businesses. They're just not back to where they were and may never, you know, quite recapture all of those members, et cetera. Um, so we saw those valuations come down, but it, it's not a function of, you know, uh, apples to apples. It's because that EBITDA numbers down and, and the realization that that's probably the new norm for, for my business as a seller in that situation. Uh, that's why, you know, the, the sales price come down. And so we, we talked about this illustrative example, you're buying a million dollar gym, in a normal environment, let's say you get, uh, you only have to put 10% down and the SBA finances the other 90%. Let's say you're a gym owner who is light on the asset side. Um, are you allowed to borrow from a different lender or a private lender that $100,000 um, to put into the deal? So equity has to be uh, exclusively non-borrowed funds. Um, the one, I, I don't, wouldn't call it a workaround, I would, I guess, exception to that is if you have a friend, family member, I, anyone you can convince that's a non-debt lender um, that's willing to gift you those funds and, and, and sign an affidavit effectively in the process that states there's no expectation of this money being repaid, um, that's acceptable. Um, but, you know, as far as going to another lender, we'd actually have to factor in that debt into the overall picture. So now instead of just, you know, in that example, a Live Oak loan payment into all those equations we've talked about, we'd, we'd need to know the monthly payment of that other debt and factor that in because it needs to be paid back. So um, the equity injection, regardless of the figure, you know, again, using 10% in this example has to come exclusively from non-borrowed uh, funds um, and again, gifted funds from a friend or family member is kind of the only true exception to that. Um, you know, if you have some equity in your house that you're able to take out a, a HELOC or a home equity line of credit on um, and you have the ability through other sources of income not related to the business being financed to pay that back, those funds can also be used for equity. But, you know, that's getting into the weeds a little bit. But that that is technically another, um, you know, usable form of, of equity injection. The key there, again, is that payment for that HELOC needs to be able to be supported and paid from another source of income completely unrelated to the business that's being financed in that, you know, situation. I was just curious, what the what's the... What's the timeline on this? We're talking about buying this million dollar gym. What do I have to bring to you? Uh, what's the checklist? And then what's the timeline? You know, how long do these things kind of take? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll answer this again in two ways, uh, just for the benefit of, of listeners, um, you know, that may not come to Live Oak specifically. Uh, a lot of banks out there do SBA loans. Um, you know, we are a preferred lending partner uh, of the SBA. So uh, a lot of banks don't have that status. Um, so the timeline is going to be the, the reason for me mentioning that is the timeline is going to be different. Um, if you're not a preferred lender, basically after you do all of your internal approval and underwriting, et cetera, you have to send that loan package out to the SBA for their review and sign off. Um, that's going to add anywhere from, quite frankly, two to six months to the process. Uh, it's a government agency. You know, they get a lot of requests every week uh, and it's a human on the other end that has to you know pick that package up and review it and get back to the bank. And if they have any questions that could, you know, keep the process going. So I just add that, um, you know, piece to working with a non-preferred lender versus a preferred lender within the SBA program. 
Um, Chat GPT can't do it for them. <laughs> well, maybe uh, there were some uh, inklings that uh, they may be trying to utilize some AI technology in expediting that process, which um, you know would be great for uh, for a lot of banks and a lot of borrowers out there because it it, it can lead to a, quite a, a long process. And you know, if anyone listening has kind of heard you know potential horror stories, if you will, of SBA lending, it typically stems from you know, not necessarily the bank you're working with dropping the ball or anything like that, just simply being at the mercy of the SBA returning, you know, that review. Um, but, you know, eliminating that stage of the process, um, you know, I like to start that clock, if you will, when I explain to people on, on how long it, it takes to kind of start talking and get your money. Um, at the time, you know, I, as a lender or any lender on my team receives kind of the initial application checklist, which to answer your question there is going to be, you know, personal tax returns for the past three years, uh, business tax returns for the past three years. If, you know, you're buying a business or you have an existing business, um, some interim or year to date financials, depending on what part of the year uh, that you're in. And then a few SBA application documents. Um, that are, you know, kind of questionnaires about yourself and checking, you know, no bankruptcies, no, you know, pending litigations or all kind of generic, uh, you know, SBA required questions you have to answer. Um, once we get all of that, it's roughly, you know, a 60 day process for the lender to review, get back to you with a uh, any questions they may have uh, a yes or no as far as the lender thinking this is something that the the bank can proceed with. Um, from that point, you go into underwriting. Um, underwriting here takes you know five to ten business days, give or take, which is is pretty quick. Um, once it is finished being underwritten, it goes to credit for their review. That's two to three days, and then the closing uh, process is the bulk of that. You know, roughly sixty days and. The only reason that's the bulk is uh, you start getting more, um, I guess, hands in the kitchen, if you will. You have attorneys coming into play that need to draw up and review loan documents. You have, you know, some reports that need to be ordered from the city, the county, the state that could take, you know, varying amounts of times to get back. Um, but all in that entire kind of, again, getting everything that we need from that initial checklist to, to funding your loan and getting money uh, in yours or the seller's hands is uh, is about 60 days, which uh, is pretty quick. I think, you know, again, the average SBA closing timeline is is probably closer to 120 days. But, um, you know, that that's due to having to send that package off to the SBA before you can actually proceed. And so so you, people are saving time because you're a preferred lender. That's right. Yeah. So with preferred lending status, you know, every bank gets audited uh, at some point, you know, throughout the year by the SBA. Um, that's kind of the only check uh, they do uh, when we fund a loan. We don't have to go through our internal process, get approval, and then say, okay, now we got to send this to the SBA and make sure they agree. They uh, assume, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, that we're doing things the way that they want them done. And then, um, you know, they'll let us know in, in our annual audits if, you uh, if we're uh, keeping up with, you know, if that's still a case or not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's, you know, it's nice because it is, you know, a huge kind of time suck to, to have yeah, to definitely. get a customer and approval and then say, you know, now it's out of our hands into the SBA's hands and we don't quite know when we'll hear back, but we'll let you know. Um, but luckily we don't have to deal with that here. So nice little and, plug there. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, are you allowed to have multiple seven? A when, when we're talking about SBA loans, I'm assuming we're talking about seven A, right? Yeah. So there's a handful of SBA loan products. Um, you know, honestly, probably not worth getting into too much of the weeds on any of them, other than seven A. It's the most common one. It's the least, I guess, restrictive as far as what you can use it for. There's really no project you can't get SBA seven A funding for. Um, so that's going to be the primary kind of product that we'll use, um, you know, at least in, in the fitness or gym space as it relates to, you know, the loans that we're funding for customers. Yeah. And can you have multiple 7A loans? You can. You can have um, actually as many SBA loans as uh, you can qualify for, so to speak. 
the the threshold is not number of loans; it's dollar amount outstanding uh, to any one individual. So these are business loans, but behind every business loan, there's an individual or individuals that own you know that business. That's how the SBA tracks dollars uh, lent to any one, I guess, entity. It's backtracking that to the individual owners. And the most, you know, outstanding you can have at one time as far as dollar amount is five million dollars, um, which is also, you know, obviously makes sense. But the largest kind of amount you can lend on any one project under the seven A, um, you know, loan product. But as you pay down loans or pay off loans, you can, you can, you know, obtain future financing. It's just about uh, outstanding at any one point in time. And you're saying that's per individual. Per individual. So let's say Mateo and I are partners. Could we potentially snag ten million dollars of seven A financing? Um, not together. So um, oh, there could be. Tale. You could get a. You could have a three million dollar loan, John. That you know you're also on Mateo, and then you know Mateo, you could seek completely separately for a different type of business or different entity. You know another two million, and you'd have five million outstanding, John. You'd still be sitting at three. Um, you know, the the trigger for that is basically who owns how much of the entity that is borrowing the money. Uh, if you're 20 percent or more owner, then you're going to personally guarantee that loan. And that loan would hit your you know balance, if you will, or, or count towards that five million dollar threshold. If you're a minority owner, um, you know, sub 20 percent in that entity and it has an SBA loan that doesn't chip away at any of your $5 million availability, you know, as far as the SBA is concerned. And is that only within the 7A program? So take, for example, we have like an EIDL loan. Would that, uh, would that go against the balance or is that like, um, they don't count that? No, EIDL, since it was a disaster relief product or, or loan, they, that, that's separate from, um, I guess, traditional uh, SBA loan products. So um, it's not just excluded from the 7A loan. It's kind of excluded from any of those other, you know, again, again, I mentioned there's a handful of, you know, normal or traditional SBA loan products, you know, PPP or EIDL. Those were, you know, again, crisis or emergency disaster relief loans. Um, They don't, trigger that against what you can borrow for, um, you know, business operations. They look at that as kind of a separate, um, something that was needed in a, in a time of disaster. Um, so luckily they don't, they don't count that towards those thresholds because, um, you know, they found it was necessary to help a lot of businesses survive. So. So if a gym isn't profitable, I'm guessing it's not going to qualify like like no one will be able to get a 7A loan to buy it essentially, right? It makes it really tough just because again that you know debt service coverage which is effectively free cash flow of the business is is really the most important factor in any SBA lending um you know for the most part. So if it's not making money, um it's really tough to you know hit any of those metrics of course. There are Again, situations or nuances where you own, you know, one, two, three, four existing businesses, you're looking to buy one that just has a seller that maybe is checked out or had some type of, you know, life changing event that has not allowed them to be as active in the business and the business is suffering because of that. Um, but you're an active, excited, you know, eager owner that's demonstrated, you know, a solid ability to operate your existing businesses and you feel good and we feel good. You can come in and implement those changes or get things back on track that your existing businesses maybe can cover some of the deficit that, you know, the business you're looking to purchase might be throwing off. Um, So it's not impossible, but, you know, when you're looking at things simplistically and it's just, you know, you're a individual looking to buy a business, if it's not making money, then it's, um, you know, going to be really, you know, tough to, to, you know, obtain SBA financing for it. And how do you come up with the, the EBITDA number if the bot, if it's a little inconsistent year over year, right? So let's say it's a hundred one year, 150 the next year, 200 the next year, it's like a growing business. Like, are you taking an average or is it typically like the last year in operation? That's a good question. There's the SBA, you know, 
prefers and or requires rather us to do a three year look back. So we have to obtain three years of filed tax returns. Um, they obviously prefer that all three of those years demonstrate or the business has demonstrated the ability to cover that debt in each of those years, respectively. Um, in reality, uh, in a situation where it's been ramping up or it had a dip and it's coming back, that last filed tax return year is going to be, you know, the biggest driver. Um, again, if the story makes sense, if if things have been equal uh, with no kind of massive interruptions over the past three years um, and two of them don't cash flow, uh, especially if it's the most recent year, that's going to be a bigger challenge. Um, but when you're talking ramp up, you know, maybe three years ago, it was still in the negative, you know, next year kind of flattened out, maybe broke even. And then the most recent year, it's finally, you know, taken off um, that year in conjunction with, you know, the trends year to date from a P&L perspective uh, can still be the driver for, you know, getting uh, the financing done based on those figures versus any type of three year average or, or uh, anything like that. Um, you know, we understand, obviously, in the case of businesses ramping up, we're not going to ding people for, you know, having to have ramped up and uh, being a business that's only three years old. So they don't have multiple years of of cash flow yet. And are you unbankable if you're you don't have three years of tax returns as a business? No, similar situation to kind of what I just mentioned. Um, you know, if you're a year and a half in or so and you haven't broken even yet, uh, on a filed tax return year or, or, you know, that plus your interim kind of period, again, depending on what time of the year doesn't show that profitability yet, that is a situation where it just may be too early to be able to obtain, you know, SBA financing for, uh, another unit or, or whatever it is you're looking for. Um, but the good news is, uh, you know, hopefully over a short period of time and you're not too far away, you know, that can be circled back and, you know, you can start the process and kind of time it up to, you know, the trends or the projected, uh, you know, break even point or profitability point. And, you know, obviously it'll take time and it's not great telling people, you know, maybe you have to wait six months, but it's better than flat out. No. And, you know, you're not, you know, bankable at any point in time. Um, so it's going to kind of follow that same, you know, thought process of uh, not having three years of positive cash flow when you're talking about if you're just too early on and you don't have three years of returns, that isn't on the surface an issue. It's about what are those returns that you do have uh, showing and you know how far away are you from, you know, profitability or not. How's this all changed when it comes to then real estate, I guess, uh, because now the EBITDA is much more important about the business you're acquiring, but how does this change then if you're trying to buy the building your, your gym's operating in? Yeah, say I'm the million dollar gym owner and I want to buy a million dollar business. How are we looking at this? Right. Yeah. So, you know, I don't want to say, you know, the real estate piece is harder with an SBA loan. I, what I will say is it's the same idea. The In this case, you're not buying a business, you're buying your building. Your business then is the key uh, financial, um, I guess, a business you're going to be analyzing in everything we've talked about so far, um, except now it's not the seller's business, it's your business and how much it cash flow that business is able to throw off in relation to, um, you know, the price of the building and, and the annual debt needed, uh, again, to, to purchase that building. The really cool thing and, you know, going back to flexibility of terms with the SBA, is when it's a real estate purchase, that loan term can actually be upwards of 25 years. Right, it can be longer. Right, so when you're business assets only, it's 10 years. When it's real estate, it's up to 25. And, you know, getting, I guess, slightly off, off topic, the best use, in my opinion, of an SBA 7A loan is when you're buying both at the same time. So you have a business you want to buy and the real estate happens to be for sale, whether it's same seller as the business or not, but it's on the table because then you can take all of that over 25 years. 
So, oh, oh really? Oh, right. Whoa. So you can finance those business assets and the real estate in one 25 year loan. Whereas if you do them separately, you're looking at a 10 year and a 25 and I don't have to, I don't think explain that obviously that monthly payment when you're doing it all together as one versus looking at what a monthly payment would be in two separate loans is going to be so much lower. That's wild. Topic, but that's the that's best sweet. Yeah, use, I think, in my personal opinion of the SBA, you know, 7A program, obviously easier said than done to find a, a business and a building that may be available for purchase together. Yeah, but, I imagine most of the, like even just in our people we know who've done it, they usually, if they've bought both or if they have both, they sell the, the gym, but they keep the real estate yeah. typically. So yeah. I imagine that's kind of hard to find. But yeah, I guess if you can find it. That's, yeah, that's over a 25 year term, that's awesome. Conventional, you know, real estate financing, you know, maybe you can find a 25 year term from a lender out there somewhere, but most of the time it's going to be 15, maybe 20. And it's going to have one of those balloon payments baked into it, as I, we kind of talked about earlier. You know, on a 15 year amortization, they're probably going to have a balloon after five or 10 years. So, uh, it looks good for the math and, you know, your debt service coverage ratio, but you also then have to have a plan, you know, in a million dollar example, maybe halfway through to have half a million dollars laying around to pay that off when the balloon hits. And similarly to, you know, the business acquisition piece we were talking about earlier when I mentioned there's no uh, balloon, there's no balloon on these real estate loans either. And there's no prepayment penalty after year five, um, real estate loans do come with, um, you know, a, a prepayment period. Uh, so that does differ a little bit, but that balloon payment, you don't have to worry about, which, um, again, on most traditional or conventional real estate financing, you're going to get a shorter term than 25 years. And you're going to have a balloon payment, you know, be due much sooner than that, that you better have a lot of money laying around to be able to, uh, you know, make that payment on, or you have to look to refinance, you know, every five or so years uh, until you can pay it off. So, so let's say I come to you, I got a nice deal, a 25 year with the business and the real estate. You underwrite, you approve me, you give me the money. I take the business over and uh, like triple the bottom line. Am I just allowed to pocket the difference or do I have to pay off more of that SBA loan? Um, or, or as long as I'm hitting the term, anything that flows to the bottom line, I get a pocket. Yeah, I mean, and you're talking about keeping all the business in real estate under your ownership, or are you talking in a sale of the business, just simply growing the business? Yeah, just simply growing the business. As the business becomes more profitable, all that, I, I get to keep that, right? There's no obligation to pay off my loan faster. No, as long as you make that monthly payment, you know, then everything over and above that is uh, free for, you know, the taking, so to speak. Um, what you're kind of talking about would be called the excess cash flow recapture. Um, and that's fairly common in um, conventional financing. Um, you know, if someone's going to be able to quadruple the business, then, you know, we'd like to maybe get that loan paid down a little faster, but not under the SBA, um, you know, program. That's just owner's money if they're able to, you know, put in the effort and, and uh, are able to drive that profitability higher. That's just more money for them. Or more money to use to be able to grow and get, you know, few additional loans to expand your enterprise or, or wherever you want to use it for effectively. Yeah, there's no requirement that if you, you start doing better, you have to pay down that loan faster. No. Nope. Angelo is out here showing you how to get rich, gym owners. This is yeah. a secret. Take, take it. Take it. Yeah. Finance, uh, grow, and, and pocket. Yeah. <laughs> Now, one other product I know you guys do um, that uh, some of our gym owners have taken advantage of is a line of credit. Can you explain how that works? Yeah. So line of credit, um, you know, for the most part, going to follow all of those, you know, like all of those, all of the things that we've spoken about to this point. It's, you know, a little bit more based on, you know, maybe a personal credit score and your credit history. But, you know, when it's a business line of credit, same kind of rules apply, need to demonstrate the ability to pay that back, et cetera, your debt service coverage, all that good stuff. But um, the difference being, or, you know, I guess starting with what a line of credit is, it's effectively this, you know, approved amount, let's just say $250,000 that um, you can draw on and use for, you know, equipment or 
building improvements or leasehold improvements, marketing campaigns, hiring, staffing, whatever you need money for your business for. Um, and that, that kind of revolves so you can pay it back. Then you have that, you know, same 250 amount to use down the road. If you don't pay it back and you draw down on it, usually there's a two or three year draw period. Um, and over that draw period, it's an interest only payment on what you've drawn. And then following that two or three year period, you typically would have five or four years to repay that amount back over more of a term loan is what it kind of converts into. So you have a monthly payment over those remaining four or five years, as I mentioned, to uh, pay that loan back. But if you know, you've drawn on it in year one, make a bunch of money and you kind of replenish that, you don't want to renew it, then you don't have a term out period because you've kind of already paid that line of credit back. But it's a really good way to kind of know that you have some level of capital laying around for, you know, whether it be a crazy situation or you know that you're going to need some money down the line for some marketing initiative or you anticipate needing to hire two or three more trainers, et cetera. Um, and you want to know you can do that before you go out and start talking to these people. Um, that's a real great resource to kind of have. And again, you know, it's an interest only payment while you're drawing on it for that two or three year period. So it's, um, you know, fairly minimal. It's not too different from a credit card. It just typically is, you know, going to come with a lower rate than a 25 or, you know, 30% uh, kind of interest rate on, on, you know, jacking up your credit card balance. So it's a more economically friendly and, and uh, cash flow friendly uh, credit card, essentially. And it's popular in like businesses that are a little lumpier in cash flow, right? Like you're an accounting firm and, you know, cash comes in and when you're away from tax season, you may not have as much cash coming in. So you use that to pay payroll and whatever, yeah, but yeah, seasonality. Like, but yeah, for a gym owner, it's different. In a traditional loan, you take out a million and whether you use the million right away or not, you're still paying interest on the million with this. It's like just what you take out is what you pay interest on, right? Yep. Yeah. And it's, um, it's a more of an as needed type of thing versus uh, the other loan products we've been talking about. It's as needed, but it's needed right now, right? It's, it's I have a particular initiative or a particular business or building that I need capital for, you know, in the next few months. Uh, and a line of credit could be, you know, during the summer months, our membership goes down because people are out enjoying the bodies that they've worked the rest of the time of the year to, to be able to show off. So our cash flow gets a little lower and we may need to replace some equipment or something in the summer when our cash balances are lower. So we know we have that. Um, so seasonality, uh, also very popular in just businesses that are, um, you know, CapEx or equipment intensive, which of course, you know, the fitness industry as a whole is, um, machines are breaking, um, you know, you may need to add more, more equipment to any, you know, given location you have because you're growing. So, you know, CapEx related biz industries and, you know, season, uh, bit industries that suffer from seasonality kind of fluctuations, uh, make really good fits for a line of credit. Yeah. So we're running, we're running short on time here, but one more question. So I'm sure you deal with a lot. Let's say I'm a gym owner. I'm bought in. I want to buy a gym. I want to use SBA financing. Who are kind of like the big brokers who, who uh, you guys see over and over again when you're financing these deals? Where should people start looking? You know, a lot of, um, I guess, brokers and for this example, isn't maybe the best term. Again, you, you mentioned at the start that we work with a lot of franchises, of course, right? So establishing relationships with the franchise and, and then, you know, sending deals is, is a lot of what I see. What I, what I see from a broker standpoint is a lot more localized business brokers or regional business brokers. Um, you know, there are some larger nationwide, I guess, fitness business brokers that exist. I will say that most of them do focus on the franchise spaces as well. So, um, you know, local general business brokers, um, are a great resource. Um, I mean, I even spend time myself as a lender, you know, kind of doing some research, reaching out, seeing if they have any listings that maybe I can help, you know, the buyer or the seller out with. Um, so I would suggest, 
you know, doing some online research for just general business brokers. If, if you happen to find, um, you know, anything by keying in fitness or gym broker specifically, all the better. Um, but, you know, transparently nationwide, there isn't, uh, I guess, one or two brokers that, that dominate um, from a nationwide standpoint. And that makes sense as well, because, you know, typically they're going to be tied to, um, you know, a local market or local banks that they've worked with. So they, they have to know they can get a deal done, of course. Um, so work with, you know, a boatload of brokers, but um, a lot of them being, you know, localized within, you know, the region of the businesses that they're looking to sell versus, uh, you know, kind of a nationwide footprint necessarily. So you heard it here. Huge business idea. Become the gym broker of, of the world. <laughs> yeah. Good luck finding a bunch of listings over a hundred grand in EBITDA. But uh, aside yeah. from that, you're, you're going to get rich with that one too. There you go. I have one more question. Sure. So just to clarify, um, cause we were talking about if you're buying a gym, you know, usually I have a business I'm trying to expand, but yep. if I have enough money for the down payment, could I still come to you and say like, Hey, I want to buy this business. I want to get in the game. I've got enough money for the down payment. Would you still lend to me potentially? Yeah, you mean if if you didn't ha own an existing business already? Yeah, yeah. I'm not doing an equity. I'm not like I'm not like expanding. I'm just like trying to get in. Yeah, no. I mean that the the same kind of qualifications that we mentioned before. Um, you know, the only difference being that that 100% financing option uh, is off the table at that point if you don't have yeah. an existing business to leverage. So you you know made sure to state that you know that individual would come with the required equity. Um, yeah, that credit score, um, you know, ideally some type of management experience doesn't even necessarily need to be in the fitness world, but, um, you know, uh, buying a business, you're going to be managing a lot of people, a lot of customers. So like to see a little bit of, uh, relatable experience in some way, shape or form. But, um, yeah, for the most part, you know, having the equity, um, and being a first time buyer, uh, is, is feasible as far as, you know, we look at it. That was a, that was a question for one particular friend I have in mind. <laughs> particular show. You got that credit score. You got no bankruptcy. Yeah. You got nice hair. You Angelo's you lending to you. You're, you're yeah. in. You're in. Hair's just a bonus, just to be clear for the listeners <laughs> out there. But uh, yeah, he's gonna get uh, 25 basis points less on his floating rate. So that's what. You, that's the good hair discount. Tell him Jim World sent you. Awesome, Angelo. So we appreciate this. I think our audience is going to find this super helpful. And I think you're definitely going to get some business from this show. Uh, if people want to work with you and Live Oak, where do they find you? Yeah, so you can go to liveoakbank.com. Um, pretty, pretty simple there. There's you know a couple tabs on the top. You're going to want to click on loans and then it's going to drill you down into all the industries that we lend in. And, you know, of course, relative to this, uh, hopefully you click the fitness centers uh, kind of button there. And then you'll see my, um, you know, ugly mug as well as my lenders on my team up there with our contact information. But, uh, you know, all of our emails, you know, at the bank are our first name, last name at liveoak.bank. So for me, that's going to be, you know, Angelo dot Medici, M-E-D-I-C-I, at liveoak.bank. Um, and, you know, from there, uh, even if it's just an exploratory question or you're looking for some more information from what I've said today and you don't have a particular business or opportunity ready, we take call calls like that all the time. You know, for me, love starting that way with people and then seeing them able to come back, you know, a few months later and taking them across that finish line for a loan. So, uh, opportunity ready or just, you know, looking for some more information, you know, that's how you can find us and we'll be happy to happy to answer any questions or, you know, take a stab at a, at a opportunity that you do have ready to go. And tell them the boys at Jim world sent you. There you <laughs> yeah. go. If you got value out of the show, be sure to like subscribe and leave a hateful comment. That's all for this week. We'll catch you next week on Jim world.